Site director Tilda Moose was staring down the barrel of the gun that would cause the apocalypse, and SCP-6000 was pulling back the hammer. Typically, someone as important as the site director of Site-19, the Foundation's largest containment site, would never be put on a mission as risky as accompanying MTF Sigma-3, aka the bibliographers, right into the heart of an active anomaly. But these were extraordinary circumstances, to say the least. Dr. Moose and the operatives of MTF Sigma-3 Fireteam Chicago entered Brazilian airspace in late December of the year 2030. Below them, an ocean of trees, the Amazon rainforest, known to some as the lung of the world, and the lung had a cancer known as SCP-6000. Director Moose could see it on the horizon, beautiful and terrifying, like a huge shimmering scar on the jungle's canopy. It had been identified a few days earlier via live satellite imaging, opening up like a wound in the world's largest rainforest, and it was growing swallowing up and affecting entire areas of land by the kilometer. Not wanting to waste any more time, the Foundation immediately sent in a recon team to gather the first intel on this rapidly developing anomaly. Once inside the affected area, known to the Foundation as the Exclusion Zone, they discovered unprecedented phenomena. The flora and fauna of the rainforest had been altered drastically in the affected areas. Trees appeared to be somehow naturally carved into living bookshelves, their leaves tattooed with words. Huge alien birds soared above the forest with their paper-like wings, also covered in text. Spotted jaguars with six or even eight limbs, like a freakish crossbreeding of animal and insect, lopped through the papery thickets in hunt of word-covered prey. Every living creature in the forest had been transformed by SCP-6000 and it was about to get a whole lot worse. If SCP-6000's exclusion zone continued to expand, not only would the anomalous effects prolong, but they'd increase in their intensity, mutating everything SCP-6000 touched, reaching further and further across the landscape. The Foundation needed to gather all the intel they possibly could on this emerging anomaly before it was too late, but time was beginning to run out. Just as they began to gain traction, the Foundation suddenly lost contact with the initial reconnaissance team. They seemed to have fallen off the map, vanished. This triggered the immediate deployment of subsequent expeditions into the SCP-6000 Exclusion Zone. When the bibliographer's first strike team arrived on the scene of the Exclusion Zone's bizarre alien world in search of the missing reconnaissance team, they found the most strange and damning discovery yet. A creature who would soon come to be known as SCP-6000-A. Much like the Exclusion Zone itself, she was both terrifying and beautiful. Half-maiden, half-monster, a sleeping woman with skin covered in scales, her legs replaced by the huge coiling tail of a python. She was reminiscent of the mythical Nagas or Gorgons, and thankfully for all the MTF members in attendance, she was already in a sort of unconscious state when they happened upon her. Perhaps even more bizarre than the creature herself was the question of what on earth had been going on around her. She was found at the base of a mutated tree, already halfway transformed into a bookcase. There were several large stones placed in the circle around her, each one covered in thaumaturgic symbols, written in what was presumably human blood, as though some strange ritual had recently been performed. But the most notable detail of all was the fact that she was surrounded by twelve corpses. Though they remain unidentified to this day, there is one thing about the corpses that was clear. They were all wearing dark robes. It didn't take the Foundation's brightest minds to calculate the connection. Figures in robes performing strange rituals, anomalous creatures everywhere, the sudden appearance of a multitude of anomalous books, and a decidedly serpentine entity. This had to be somehow related to the Serpent's Hand, an infamous group of interest that takes a hard stance on defying the Foundation's secrecy and revealing the truth about anomalies to the world. While still comatose, SCP-6000-A was secured and taken back to be contained in Facility 57 while Sigma-3 Fireteam Chicago suited up and prepared for their first trip into the Exclusion Zone. Among them, of course, was Site-19 Director Tilda Moose. So let's answer the big question on everyone's mind right now. Why send someone as important as a Site Director into a potentially hazardous environment 
where an entire reconnaissance team had already gone missing and the serpent's hand were believed to still be operating. Because nobody at the Foundation understands the serpent's hand quite like Director Moose. After all, in another life before joining the SCP Foundation, she worked with them. To the Foundation, cooperative ex-GOI members are worth their weight in gold, and in a situation like this, nobody could possibly be more valuable than Director Moose. She knew the way, and we mean that literally. All signs pointed to SCP-6000 being the largest and most unstable Class W gateway that the Foundation has ever discovered. But you might be more familiar with the concept of Class W gateways when they're referred to simply as the Ways. The entrances into and out of the Wanderer's Library. The legendary extra-dimensional location that exists as a nexus between various realities that has become a kind of unofficial headquarters for the Serpent's Hand. Director Moose had used the Ways before to enter and gain access to the Wanderer's Library back when she was one of the Hands, but even she admitted that she'd never seen anything quite like SCP-6000. When they touched down and Director Moose first saw the environment around them, the shelves, the books, the pages, the text, she felt a powerful sense of deja vu. It was just like the library, but something was wrong. The way here was not a standard dimensional doorway, it was more like a kind of open wound, and the Wanderer's Library was spilling out of it and into our world. Given the raw cosmic power of the library, it was bound to twist our world into its own image, not the other way around. There was only one thing to do from here. With Director Moose leading at the head, they would use this vast new way to travel into the heart of the Wanderer's Library itself and search for answers. After all, the library is said to contain all knowledge across the multiverse, so presumably it would grant them the solution they needed to the SCP-6000 dilemma they were faced with. But getting answers from the library, especially if you work for the SCP Foundation, is easier said than done. As Fireteam Chicago made their way further into SCP-6000, they reached an area that Director Moose could at least recognize as the true Wanderer's Library. The dirt gave way to wood paneling beneath their feet. The air shimmered like an oil slick. Mutated trees gave way to giant empty bookcases, like they were witnessing the birth of a new expansion. As soon as they arrived and began venturing through the labyrinthian corridors of the Wanderer's Library, the library's inhabitants took notice. Surprised that the library has some permanent residents? Don't be. After all, you can hardly have a library without librarians. As only people with experience like Director Moose know, the Wanderer's Library has an enormous contingent of creatures known as librarians and archivists permanently wandering their halls, arranging the books, and protecting the location from threats. Threats like Fireteam Chicago. The team had their weapons at the ready when they first saw the creatures appearing all around them. Director Moose noticed a giant red millipede skittering around the hall past them, an archivist. It didn't appear actively threatening but its presence already was a bad sign. Then a feminine hissing voice rang out through the air. It said, I see your intentions. Be gone. Something about it communicated a dark and infinite power. And with that, more nightmarish librarians entered the scene. Huge spider-like beings with countless limbs. Class three librarians began crawling down the bookcases towards them, but there was something different about these creatures, something even worse. They were wearing the uniform of the reconnaissance team. In fact, once upon a time, they were the reconnaissance team, but their stories had taken a drastic turn since they got involved with SCP-6000, something the rest of the world would soon be able to relate to. Just seeing this terrified moose, it wasn't unheard of for the library to transform people into librarians, but that was typically a punishment reserved for people who commit only the gravest offenses against the anomaly. What had caused the Wanderer's Library to become so actively aggressive? They didn't have time to think about it because things were getting worse. As the Class Three librarians reached the bottom of the bookcase, they began to give chase, leading to Fireteam Chicago desperately fleeing the scene. But they weren't fast enough. The creatures began to attack, tackling and slaughtering members of the team. The survivors fired back, but this led to even more aggression from the librarians. Soon a group of Class II librarians, giant hooded beings wielding lanterns, began to join the chase. 
What started as a highly organized mission soon became a massacre. The Foundation operatives were hopelessly outnumbered by the library's legion of obedient monsters. They could not fight and win. It was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Director Moose was lucky to escape with her life, and in response to the newly assessed severity of the SCP-6000 threat, a wider barrage of containment methods, known as Project Fusilade, was initiated. This meant making Facility 57 the official containment site of SCP-6000. This also resulted in the deployment of active arrest warrants put on all active Serpent's Hand cells, as well as giving MTF Sigma-3 blanket permissions to aggressively use any means of force against the Wanderer's Library's growing aggression. But trouble was already brewing back at Facility 57. SCP-6000-A had awakened, an attempt to attack the Foundation personnel around it. When it, or rather, she, was safely recontained, Director Moose volunteered to interview her firsthand. She hoped that the creature might at least have some information about what was going on with SCP-6000. When the interrogation began, 6000-A referred to Director Moose as a jailer, the serpent's hand expression for members of the SCP Foundation. From this, Moose could easily recognize that 6000-A had once been a member of the hand, a human too, but she'd been changed into her current form by a far more powerful being, the serpent the great entity that rules the Wanderer's Library and the very namesake of the Serpent's Hand. A being as old as the universe, the queen of all knowledge, and a kind of god in her own right. In a sense, Director Moose had a standing grudge with the Serpent. Back when she was a member of the Hand, Moose was thirsty for knowledge. She craved stories, but always frustrated by the fact that they had to end. She stole sacred texts from the archive of the Wanderer's Library and ensured that she would never truly be welcome again. As the interview ended, 6000-A promised to continue looking through the stories of the library, hoping that the answer to their struggles would perhaps be hidden within. Meanwhile, as SCP-6000 continued its aggressive expansion through the Amazon, mutating and consuming more land, the efforts of Project Fusilade subsequently escalated as well. In one of the largest coordinated efforts in Foundation history, Operation Black Star, mobile task forces on every continent conducted a simultaneous raid on every single known Serpent's Hand hotspot worldwide. And they found nothing. Every single base was empty. All over the world, not a single member of the Serpent's Hand could be found. It was roundly concluded that they'd all return through the world's various ways into the Wanderer's Library, like a mothership that was calling them all home. The Serpent's Hand, the only people who might have known what was coming, were escaping the planet. As far as bad signs go, this was probably the worst one possible. The proverbial rats fleeing the ship. And if the library wanted its servants to leave the Earth, it stood to reason that the Serpent had something horrible planned for everyone and everything left on it. Not long after this, Director Moose decided to deliver a grim statement to the O5 Council about SCP-6000, informing them of the gravity of this new situation. I don't know what precipitated this, but if the libraries turned against humanity, the situation is going to be dire. It's a completely alien entity to us. We can't even begin to understand why it is or does the thing it does. Hell, we don't even know if there's a rhyme or reason to anything. Most Foundation personnel only know of the library in the abstract, but I and a handful of others have actually stepped foot in the shelves and we can tell you that it is humanity's greatest blessing and its greatest threat all at the same time. Imagine how much history has been influenced by people getting into the library and bringing back knowledge they would otherwise never have had. Now imagine if the source of all knowledge in the universe turns on us. I don't see this story having a happy ending. In spite of her grim prognosis, Director Moose couldn't give up. In fact, she was relieved of her duties as Site-19 Director in order to pursue the SCP-6000 case and subvert the library apocalypse full-time, seeing as it seemed she was the only high-ranking member of Foundation personnel who truly understood what was going on. She and the rest of the Project Fusilade Incident Committee scrambled to find ways to destroy SCP-6000, or at least put a halt to its rampant growth. They sent in legions of mobile task forces with flame and heat-based weaponry, trying to burn down all of the mutated trees. However, the trees showed an almost complete resistance to this method, with burnt matter quickly regenerating after the fact. In an even more savage act of war against the Wanderer's Library itself, 
they fired a high-yield explosive into the mouth of SCP-6000. However, the second the bomb passed the threshold into the library, its effects were immediately nullified. These concerning developments led to Moose and her team finally pulling out the big gun. Literally, the biggest gun there is. The Arturus Array. A giant satellite-mounted laser cannon, only called in for the most dire situations due to its huge potential for collateral damage. However, when they fired the array's beam down onto SCP-6000 at full power, it remained utterly unaffected. These were just three of the 34 different failed attempts by Project Fusillade to put an end to the library's rampage before it could keep expanding, and eventually destroy the Earth. In a fit of desperation, Moose returned once again to SCP-6000-A, hoping she would have more answers. They needed a miracle to stop this thing from becoming an XK-class scenario. At first, the imprisoned Snake Woman was cryptic. Instead of giving Moose useful information, she told her the true origin of the Serpent's Hand. They were once a cult devoted to the Serpent herself, warriors on behalf of Knowledge Incarnate. The modern Serpent's Hand, which claims to be comparatively secular, is little more than a shadow of what it used to be. But they still perform the same basic task, destroying secrecy and advancing knowledge. As Moose's patience wore thin, she asked the snake whether she had any specific stories about how the Foundation could beat a library gone mad, but the snake told her there were no such stories. She did, however, surrender one vital piece of information, saying, All the stories I see with the Foundation staring down the end of the world, they have the book burners by their side. I suppose there's something to say there. Rivals allying themselves against a threat greater than either could imagine. Smoking ash, a fusillade of fire against a wall of trees. There it was, Fusillade, the namesake of Moose's project against SCP-6000, which the snake would have no way of knowing about. This was it. This was the one narrative thread that could lead them to their salvation. But there was one other deal that caught Moose's well-trained eye as well the book burners. Better known to the SCP Foundation and to you as the Global Occult Coalition, one of the Foundation's most bitter rivals in the field of combating the strange. But this time, would it be worth putting aside their differences to face the greatest threat in their shared history? Could the Foundation and the GOC together be the fusillade that holds back the library's terrifying advance once and for all? The O5 Council held a vote on whether the Foundation should get the GOC involved. After much deliberation, the motion was approved by a narrow three-vote margin. An emergency envoy from the Foundation was immediately sent to GOC headquarters in Germany to invite them to become a part of Project Fusillade and stop SCP-6000 expansion before it was too late. After comprehending the full scope of the situation and finally coming to understand just how incredibly dangerous SCP-6000 was, the leaders of the GOC approved this historic high-level partnership. GOC Physics, Psyche, and Ptolemy Division personnel were transported to Facility 57 for briefing on the developing situation. If they were lucky, they weren't too late to stop this XK-class end-of-the-world scenario from unfolding into completion. Interestingly, the GOC, prior to the SCP-6000 incident, had actually conducted more successful raids into the Wanderer's Library than even the Foundation had. So it was natural that, soon after they became officially involved, the O5 Council and GOC Command authorized another mission into the library, with GOC Strike Team 9842 Probable Cause, codenamed Harbor, in order to discover more about the situation from within. Director Moose and one of her closest associates, Agent Adam McMillan, another former Serpent's Hand turned Foundation agent, would instruct the team via live video and audio link. Supplied with state-of-the-art GOC and Foundation equipment, the Harbor team entered the exclusion zone. They couldn't help but remark on the extraordinary sights before them. A shimmering technicolor fantasy filled with trees halfway transformed into bookcases. But strangely, all of the books within them were utterly blank. Following the instructions delivered by Moose and McMillan, the Harbor team advanced further until they found an area where the forest properly converged into the library itself. Much like Fire Team Chicago had been, the Harbor Strike Team was baffled to find that this new, expanding wing of the library didn't seem to have any books inside its endless bookcases. 
The team remained discreet as roving librarians patrolled the halls and skittered about high above them. Security in the Wanderer's library had grown exponentially. Eventually, Harbor found the first book of the new wing, a slim volume entitled simply In Progress, much like SCP-6000's takeover of the world outside. But before they could relay the knowledge within the book back to Moose and Macmillan, the voice of the serpent herself once again sounded. She asked the two members of the Harbor Strike Team why they were there, and when they claimed to simply be following orders from their commanders, the all-powerful knowledge deity accused them of lying. The Strike Team members trembled in fear. Moments later, the two operatives were claimed by the library, much like the SCP Foundation recon team before them. The signal link between Harbor and Command was severed. They were gone. The Foundation and the GOC's first joint venture against SCP-6000 had been useless, but that wasn't the worst part. The library's unprecedented counterattack was about to ruin everything that the two groups had been trying to achieve over their entire existence. SCP-6000 began putting out radio signals, but it wasn't just 6000 itself. Every single abandoned Serpent's Hand cell all over the globe suddenly began transmitting and boosting the signal as well. It was too big and too coordinated for even the combined efforts of the Foundation and the Coalition to get a handle on. The signal was the voice of the Serpent herself, hissing, the garden is the Serpent's place. And a lot of people heard it. Governments, organizations, and individuals all over the world picked up the signal and its ultimate source, the Amazon rainforest. As millions of people began to turn their attention to the Amazon, their eyes were drawn to one thing, SCP-6000 and its enormous shimmering oil slick expanding out over the canopy. Too big now for the Foundation and the GOC to keep under wraps anymore. The internet blew up with millions of posts and messages across every platform imaginable. Even the Foundation's web crawler was utterly overwhelmed. One forum poster said, You guys see the pictures coming out of Brazil? MSN's probably gonna get a hold of it by tomorrow and suppress the story, but it's insane. I have no clue what the hell is going on in the Amazon, but the pictures make it look like some sort of oil slick. It's kind of beautiful. Another commented, Yep, turns out I'm not nuts. My friends have been hearing it on their car radios and hams, too. A woman's voice, sort of nasally, repeating numbers, coordinates, I think. And the words, the garden is the serpent's place. Sounds biblical. Maybe a passphrase of some sort? Now, here's the kicker. If you look on Google Earth or anything for the coordinates, everything's fine. It doesn't show anything out of the ordinary. But if you use a backdoor to get into the wildlife observation camera scattered around, the cameras went offline immediately after, but I managed to save this image. Starting to think I should go down there. This could be big. But random people on the internet were just the tip of the iceberg. It didn't take long for all the classified information about SCP-6000 to fall into the hands of a number of mainstream media outlets. The Wall Street Journal ran it with the headline, The Amazon Anomaly. Not long after, The Guardian released Brazil Under Lockdown, as the efforts of the Foundation and the GOC to keep a lid on things started to look more like a military coup than a routine quarantine effort. The horrors started to snowball. News about the strange activity in the Amazon led to a massive influx of tourists and amateur investigators attempting to gain access. While the Foundation and the GOC did what they could to hold people off and provide amnestics to those who were actually exposed, it wasn't enough. The cat was out of the bag, and now any attempts to cover up what had already been released felt like just another element of the conspiracy. Knowledge was spreading fast, and in trying to cover it up, both the Foundation and the GOC risked exposing even their own existences to the public in the process. The Serpent's plan had been working perfectly, it seemed. But this was more than a mere compromise of informational security. The increased global knowledge of SCP-6000 seemed to massively increase its expansion, as though it fed on people's knowledge of it. The exclusion zone grew by a terrifying six kilometers, and the mutations within its boundaries only seemed to intensify. Things that had gotten so severe that the Coalition's nuclear resources were being considered as a response to SCP-6000's aggression. Not long after this, Director Moose's closest confidant within Project Fusillade, Agent McMillan, disappeared. Security footage of Facility 57 showed him performing a thaumaturgic ritual circle, similar to the one that had produced SCP-6000-A. The cameras captured an intense flash of light from the circle, and afterwards, McMillan was gone. He left a note for Director Moose, saying, Sorry, Tilly. 
I used to spend weeks amongst the library shelves, perusing everything I could come across. It was otherworldly in the most literal sense of the word. I'm sure you understand the feeling. The difference is that you couldn't go in. You made the choice between the library and the foundation. When I first entered, it was just a mission. I experienced something amazing, something well beyond what I thought was ever possible. And I thought it was a shame that we looked at something so magnificent and only worried about how it might hurt us. I can see now that's not the case. The librarians are only hurting people that try to stop the expansion. I have no intention of doing that. This is the end of the story, not the one where we somehow come up with a silver bullet to fix everything. The only thing I can do is change how I feel about it. I just want to sit amongst the shelves and see the false stars again. I think this is my happy ending. Director Moose certainly didn't see it that way. In spite of everything, she was still desperately searching for that elusive silver bullet. The secret to stopping SCP-6000 and reversing the horrific damage it had already wrought. They were the SCP Foundation. They always found a solution. It was just a matter of looking harder for it. She returned once again to her last potential resource on the matter, SCP-6000-A. That cryptic snake woman they'd first discovered in the initial recon missions into SCP-6000. In many ways, SCP-6000-A echoed the sentiments of Agent McMillan. To deny true fate is futile. Just this once, the Foundation had run out of silver bullets. Their end was coming, perfect and inevitable, and it will happen at the hands of the Library and the Serpent. She told Director Moose that you don't get to choose how your stories end, only how you perceive the ending. This story, she says, ends with two people sitting in a room talking, and they vanish into thin air. Tired of the Snake Woman's cryptic nonsense, Director Moose decided she was wasting her time. Determined, she, alongside the Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition, would find a way to stop this thing. They would end SCP-6000, reverse the damage it had caused, and save the day. Unfortunately, this time, they couldn't. The entire Amazon Basin was quarantined by Project Fusilade, but it didn't matter. SCP-6000 just kept growing and growing and growing. Soon after, a BM-class Broken Masquerade scenario transpired, meaning that the Foundation and the GOC were no longer able to contain the secrets of this anomaly, as more and more of the Western Hemisphere was consumed by SCP-6000. The Anomaly's object class was upgraded from Keter to Apollyon, as GOC Command and the O5 Council realized that the ship had officially sailed on its fight for containment, and for the future of planet Earth. As the Wanderer's Library continued to consume more of the planet in the following days, the priorities of Project Fusilade shifted focus from containing SCP-6000 to getting as many key figures and anomalies as possible off of Earth or out of our dimension. All population centers, GOC bases, and Foundation sites were considered lost. It was over. The Serpent had won. One person who didn't flee with all the others was Director Moose, with the prognosis being that SCP-6000 would consume the entire world in the next two weeks. Moose decided to go down with the ship, spending her last days on a dying Earth with her final prisoner, SCP-6000-A. The Snake Woman tried to comfort Director Moose in the face of the end. She told her that all there really is in life is a collection of stories. One ending is the beginning to countless others. The end of this Earth, this foundation, would simply unravel onto more, splitting like a thread's end into infinite narrative possibilities. If Moose could only accept this, she would not see this as an ending, but as a wonderful new beginning. A possibility for more stories. That's why the library was making all these new empty bookcases. There would soon be an abundance of new knowledge to accommodate and fill its shelves. Still, Moose seemed mournful about what she saw as the end of her story, the end of the world. She asked 6000 A whether her attempts to stop everything had been pointless from the start, if this ending had always been set in stone. 6000 A responded, The point was the same thing that it's ever been, to make new stories where there was once nothing. Be happy, Tilda. Your story is going to be remembered forever. How do you think Tilda Moose responded? Did she say, you think people will read about us? Or rather, did she ask, 
What if I don't want new stories? We'll give you a moment to think about it. Are you ready? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Because regardless of what director Moose said, it would have ended exactly the same way. If this tale teaches you anything, it should be that you really can't choose your ending. You can only choose how you react to it. Director Moose looked up and realized she was no longer inside Facility 57. She was in the Wanderer's Library, staring up at an infinitude of shelves that contained an expanse of books that were both boundless and immeasurable. She was surrounded by people and entities of all shapes and sizes, wearing robes, browsing the new collection, and she recognized all of her old Foundation friends and colleagues among them. Director Moose's story had come to an end, but what she had failed to grasp was that the end didn't just mean death, it meant the start of something new. New worlds, new dimensions, new canons, new anomalies. A vast infinity of stories. And from inside the Wanderer's library, with everyone she'd ever known, she could enjoy them all. The Wanderer's library and the Serpent's Hand hadn't killed her, they had saved her. This was Director Moose's happy ending, and also the ending of SCP-6000. But what if this wasn't the end? What if instead, Tilda Moose had chosen a third option and responded to 6000-A's comment about her story being remembered forever, not with a question, but a statement. Stories on stories. Perhaps if she had answered this way, then she would have been swept away from the world that was dying around them to somewhere new. And not just one world, but many where she could have the chance to see a utopian version of Earth, where anomalies were a part of everyday life, their powers a part of the fabric of society, where disease and suffering had become a thing of the past. She may then have seen alternate versions of her own story, where she remained a member of the Serpent's Hand until the very end, or even another where she was a member of the O5 Council. These were all stories running parallel to hers and ours, real yet untouchable. All she could do was watch these realities, knowing that she'd be unable to help or interact with the people she saw, just as SCP-6000-A had only been able to observe ours. But in the end, that was okay, because there was always another story to move on to. Someone else's story to become invested in, something else incredible to see. Because just like in the Wanderer's Library, the end of one story only means the start of so many others. Now go check out SCP-5000-Y, the full story compilation, and SCP-XK Class End of the World Scenarios Explain for more SCP Foundation tales about the end of the world as we know it. If you can really call it an end, that is.